Good morning, everyone. This is Monica Stocke with VIAS, and we're going to get started, but I wanted to uh, give you some housekeeping uh, kind of uh, answers first. We will have uh, questions. Uh, happy to answer all your questions. Please type them in the uh, chat window, and we will get to them uh, at the very end. We'll have uh, a question session. Then if you have any questions, if you have any issues with um, you know, audio at all, uh, let us know. Uh, but it sounds like everyone can hear us just fine. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just go over very quickly a little bit about uh, VIAS and what we offer, and then go right into our webinar uh, to talk about uh, how to find your loads for your analysis um, questions and analysis studies. So we were gonna, I'm gonna switch over uh, to, to show my slides now. So I, we just wanted to, uh, the presenter today is going to be Tim Hunter from Wolfstar Technologies. And I just wanted to say a couple of things about bias. Can you see my screen okay? Give me one moment, I'm trying to show my screen. Here we are. Can you see my screen okay? Perfect. So I wanted to share a little bit about uh, who we are. And uh, we have uh, multiple industry experience uh, in uh, high tech, in, uh, in automotive, oil and gas, um, industrial equipment, a lot in petrochemical and process. Uh, medical devices, aerospace. So we were present in most industries and we have a presence also throughout the country and internationally. We have our headquarters in Houston, we're in Cincinnati and Chicago, Detroit and San Francisco. Most of our uh, staff has either a PhD or a master's uh, to allow for us to help our customers the, the best way we can. We are one of only a handful of Dassault Systems Platinum Partners, and we work with uh, Simulia, including Abacus, iSight, Effisafe, and Tosca, as well as Katia, Delmia, and Novia, and uh, the 3D Experience platform. And we're more than happy to answer any questions about those things if you have them later. We are a partner also of uh, several additional uh, technologies, including Wolfstar Technologies, which is what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we provide uh, not only uh, software, but also engineering, uh, consulting, automation and customizing, as well as training. So today we're going to hear from uh, Tim Hunter, who is the president of Wolfstar Technologies. Uh, he's also the founder of Wolfstar Technologies, uh, which is an engineering, consulting and software development firm which concentrates on the usage of FEA and test data on engineering problems. Uh, Tim brings 30 years of product development experience to his clients' projects in innovative software. Uh, and Tim obtained most of his product development experience at Harley-Davidson, where he was chief engineer prior to launching Wolfstar Technologies. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Marquette and a master's and PhD in engineering from uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And we're very excited that he can join us today and share his uh, experience and knowledge. Tim, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna send it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. And I'm very happy to be here. And let me just get my screen sharing going. Okay, and uh, I'm just, uh, getting my, my screen set up here so I can see everything. So just to, um, before we get started, uh, uh, Monica mentioned about the chats. Also, there's a Q&A in your Zoom meeting interface here. 
So if you can see when uh, in, your, in the GUI for your meeting interface, there should be an area for Q&A. So we'll be checking both the chat and the Q&A, but if you can, please type your questions into the Q&A. Uh, we will try to get to the questions at the end. If we can't get to them all, we'll definitely try to follow up with an email and contact you individually if we don't get to them on this webinar. So without further ado, thank you very much for joining us today um, to learn about TrueLoad from Wolfstar Technologies. Uh, this uh, in image that you see on the screen here, this is actually a project that was done with the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee SAE Baja car team, and we'll get to that at some point during the presentation here. But this was a fun project. Um, and then the next slide here, uh, this is what we like to call the money slide. So this is just an example from one of our customers about their experience with TrueLoad and, uh, and how they could quantify that. So we did this project with them. We went through five design iterations, and, it, and when we talked to them afterwards about that, uh, they said if they'd done the project without TrueLoad, each design iteration would have cost them $30,000 in parts, six weeks to prototype it, so that would have been about $150,000 in 30 weeks. And using the TrueLoad technology, we were able to do all of this in eight days, and if you amortize the cost of TrueLoad, it, it worked out to be less than $1,000. So that's the order of magnitude that our customers see in the value add. And we'll get into detail on this project as well, too. Okay, so just to catch your attention and, and, uh, and just to uh, bait you to see where the customer examples are. So, uh, again, a little bit more about me and Wolfstar Technologies. Um, Wolfstar Technologies was founded in 2010 by, by me, Tim Hunter. Prior to that, I was a chief engineer at Harley Davidson for 23 years. I had been involved in every aspect of product development. Um, and uh, we, you know, I've, I've understand dealing with styling, dealing with, with marketing, dealing with uh, last minute changes, uh, uh, customer issues, launching products in the plant. I've been through it all. I understand what you all go through. So I think we've got products that can really help you out. My whole career, I've been an FEA guy. Even as an executive level chief engineer, I was still doing FEA. It's just in my blood, okay? So um, since we launched the company, uh, our partners have been Dassault Systems, Ansys, MSC. These companies really see the value in our product and that what we can offer their customers, so they really want to help us bring it to market to help out their customers and help their customers use their tools. This company here on the end, CE Tron, that's our visualization technology, and they provide the 3D visualization capabilities and the readers for all the different databases for FEA models, so we can deal with any FEA database. So. Uh, and just one second, please. I'm going to turn my uh, my cursor into a pointer so you can see what's going on better. Um, so here we go. So the products from Wolfstar, Wolfstar Technologies are uh, TrueLoad. This is our flagship product. So TrueLoad turns parts into load transducers, and we do that by strategically placing strain gauges on the FBA model in response to unit load cases, and we extract a correlation matrix. Then the customer places strain gauges on physical parts, measures the strain data, then we take the measured strain data, multiply it by that correlation matrix to back calculate the load. We are simply turning the part into a load transducer, and we're leveraging the FPA model to do that, okay? Uh, the next product we've got is a product we call TrueQSE. TrueQSE stands for quasi-static events. And basically this product simply takes results from your FPA model and literally superimposes it via user-defined functions. And that's all well and good, but what happens is when you're using TrueLoad, TrueLoad's gonna generate time histories of scaling functions for your unit load cases, and then TrueQSC gives you the ability to post-process those results very quickly and easily, generate X, Y results, plots for any point in the model, you can generate operating deflection shapes and do whatever you want with that data. So, so basically, true QSE is a way for you to post-process your FEA model once you've got the loading information. And it's so important, we bundle true QSE with true load. So when you buy true load, you get true QSE automatically. And then the third product we've got is a product called true LDE. And that starts stands for linear dynamic events. And that simply is a post-processor for linear dynamic solutions. Many of the post-processors out there for FEA haven't really oriented them towards the, the needs of looking at 
models when, when you have a time domain or a frequency domain results for, for uh, linear dynamic solutions. And so this is tailored just to that. So basically it's helping you out understand your FBA results um, more easily and better. And that's a purely analysis post-processing tool. It's got nothing to do with tests. And then all of our tools then can export to the major FEA-based fatigue softwares out there. So if you've got an FEA-based fatigue software, we can really give you loading and event information that you need in order to drive the software properly. We, we generate macros and there are all the data files you need to run the, that software. You don't need to have FEA-based fatigue software to use our tools, but if you have it, have it we make using an FEA-based fatigue software just a natural part of your workflow and make using those tools much easier to use. Okay, so getting right into TrueLoad. So what's, uh, the motivation behind TrueLoad is quite simply, what's the load? So if you're a design engineer that's got designed parts for this motorcycle, or the FAA analyst that's got to uh, guarantee the functionality and, and durability of these parts, you look at the loading on this motorcycle, and it is crazy nonlinear. You can't measure the loads, you can't simulate the loads, but you as the design engineer, or you as the analytical engineer, you're held responsible for the performance and durability of those parts. So what do you do? So what we recognize is the individual components are basically responding linearly. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna recognize the swing arm, frame, the crankcase, the handlebars, the fenders, the luggage system. These are all basically responding linearly. We're gonna place strain gauges on those and turn them into the load transducers so you can get the operating loads for the individual components and subsystems in order to understand what's going on. So this is what we're doing with Chula. We are, we are going in and we are turning the parts into the load transducers. Now, this is the first to market solution. It's based on a technology called influence coefficients. And influence coefficients have been around for 50 plus years. And influence coefficients have been a very experimentally based uh, technique. And, and historically, when you read the papers on this, people have, guessed at where to place the gauges. They've done a very poor job in setting up the fixturing for the load cases, and it becomes very laborious and prone to errors. And we've taken all of that labor out of the front end, and we've automated that with scripting and leveraging your FEA model so we can do the stuff that was done in the lab automatically in the FEA model. So that's what we're doing. So if you've got products that get loading from the environment, uh, you know, so whether it's on-road, off-road, uh, you get your products getting uh, loading from the customer, from the equipment itself, from the from extreme use in the, in the land, or even wind, sea, and air. Um, we can handle all those things. We've got customers in most of these product segments right now, and and it, we just are able to bring value to our products customers to our customers' products because they can understand the loading and very rapidly do uh, iteration. Uh, this is a little background on product development. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. This is the V diagram. It's used largely in the automotive industry. But basically, you know, in product development, you kind of start off with the, with, uh, the voice of the customer, come through your product requirements, functional specs, and you get into the system, subsystem, and component design. And this is typically CAD and FEA that you're flushing these things out. And so this is all on the virtual side of things. And then when you want to verify that things are actually working properly, you come up the physical side. You start with component test, subsystem, and system test, and you finally get acceptance and product realization and launching the product. So this is a typical product development B diagram. And what happens is that TrueLoad leverages these component, subsystem, and system level tests to take data, valuable data from your testing organization, and drive them back into the virtual world to help you drive your FPA models, to help you through these design and iteration processes faster and quicker and actually eliminating whole integration cycles altogether. Now, this is again, this is more review of product simulation workflow here. Everybody knows about this. You start with the CAD data, so this get one of the major CAD packages. You come in with a solid model of your parts. You bring it into your FBA uh, package and you can pick out, you can, you can mesh this up. You can pick out your, your material model, your solve, your, your solution techniques. And then you, you need to come up with some sort of loading, okay? And typically what'll happen is you'll do a back of the napkin uh, calculation. Your department might have some standards. You might get some loads from your customers. But at the end of the day, you come up with some loading and you put that in the FTA model and you get some results. 
And once you've done that once, you then often will want to understand the durability. And so you'll, you'll come into a, a, a fatigue package, um, like one of the major fatigue packages out there. And, and uh, in order to do that, though, you've got to take this loading that you've had and then figure out how does that loading vary over time and then apply that to your fatigue software and as an event. And then the fatigue software can tell you how many times that event repeats. And then once you've done that once, oftentimes you'll want to bring that into the optimization world and run through this cycle automatically with the various optimization tools that are out there. So this is, this is pretty standard. I know most of you are doing this type of uh, work already. But you look at this diagram, there are mature products on every block of this diagram except for the two most important ones, the loading and the event generation. And what I hope to show you today is that the tools from all sorts of technologies of true load and true QSE, we can really help you understand those, those parts of your analysis and get you proper loading and proper event definition right from the get-go. So this all makes more sense and this is more effective for you. So, um, you know, you look at, uh, historical concerns with loading and you know when you go in to do an analysis you can have the perfect CAD model you can have perfect mesh you can have perfect material model you can have the perfect solver and then you go to throw it in for a load and oftentimes you're just guessing at what the load case is and if you're guessing at the load case you're basically guessing at the, the solution in the US we've got this term that we call GIGO it's called garbage in garbage out so if you're just guessing at the inputs you're just guessing at the outputs and it's really not giving you much of value and then you end up doing extra iteration cycles. What people try to do to eliminate that guesswork is they try to use tools like these load transducers like you see on the, on the left of the screen here. And, and these load transducers are great, but problems with them are they're expensive. And then every time you use one, you've got to cut away material in your product. You've got to insert the load transducer. So now you've just changed the mass. You just changed the stiffness. You're measuring something it may or may not be the actual loads. And then worse, you bring it to the analyst, and the analyst is working on the as-designed part. And now the analyst has got to go in and rework his FEA model to look like the test part in order to use the loads that you just measured. So it's not great, but this is traditionally what people have got to do, okay? So another approach that, that uh, uh, people try to do is use strain gauges. And so typically what will happen is an FEA guy will look at their, their FEA model, come up with 10, 20 strain gauge locations, we'll talk to their colleague, come up with a few more, they'll, they'll lay 30 strain gauges on the product, they go to the field, the proving grounds, and lay the strain gauges on the product, and they look at the strain data, and they look at the FEA model, and they just scratch their heads. They can't make any sense out of it. The loading in the field is so complex, loading the FEA model is relatively simple. So, so typically what happens is, is, is you eliminate all but one or two channels of data, and all but one or two points in time, and you iterate for days, if not weeks, to come up with a load case that just matches that strain data qualitatively, not even quantitatively. And then you use that for your redesign loads, and then the next time you get to the field, you find you've missed something, and you start the process all over again. I have done this in my experience. I am sure many of you have done this as well. This is just a problem with it. With it uh, FEA analysis and, and dealing with test data, okay? So what's wrong? Well, your companies are investing in great analysts, and world-class software, they're getting the right stuff for testing, and you're investing in tools for doing fatigue analysis. Your companies are making all of the right investments, but they're not getting the right answers. What's going on? Well, the problem is you just got too many variables. You got load, gauge, gauge locations, load cases, and the quantity of data. So if you lay 30 strain gauges on a product part, you go to the proving ground, you get a time history of data back, that time history of data could be a half million data points long. And the problem is, is that at every point in that time series, the strain response has got a unique loading at every point in time. So if you've got a half million data points, you've got a half million loading recipes, you can't do that manually. So you're locked in this no-win solution position. You can't solve this problem manually. And, it's, and you're, you're left in this no-win position. So the solution is true load. So true load quite simply does in-situ load measurement. So we're going to 
In situ means in location load measurement. So we're going to turn your parts into the multi-channel load cells. We're going to look at the FDA model, figure out the right place to lay string gauges, and we'll basically work, have that FDA model now work with the test data to back calculate all the loading on the, on the product. We can work with any FDA. We've got really nice plugins for ANSYS Workbench and Abacus CAE. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you get optimal gauge placement. And if you're using FDA-based fatigue, we can help you out there too and get you the, the right data for your FDA-based fatigue. So that, that's the high level of what TrueLoad is doing, okay? So here's the workflow for TrueLoad. Um, so we're gonna start, when we go into TrueLoad, we're gonna start with an FDA model. And, um, and it, we'll just use your normal FDA model. But rather than having you come in with a complex load case, I'm going to have you decompose that into a series of unit loads. So that could be one kilonewton in the X direction, one kilonewton in the Y direction, one kilonewton in the Z direction. Maybe some pressure loads, maybe some thermal loads, maybe some inertial loads. But at the end of the day, you're going to have a series of unit load cases, and you're designing the load sensitivity for your parts. And the way you need to think about these loads is, is if you mix these loads together, could you approximate the operating conditions of your product? So that's how you need to think about your unit load cases, okay? So this is you doing your work, doing the engineering work, thinking about your part, and trying to figure out how load is coming into your part product. Once you do that and solve your FAA model, then the pretest comes in, pretest module of true load comes in and looks at all the strain results in the FDA model, comes up with optimal strain gauge placements, and then there's tools that lets us reposition it and reorient the gauges. But at the end of the day, once we get the gauges laid where we want them, we're gonna extract a correlation matrix that relates strain response at the, at the gauges to each of the unit load cases, and we'll store that correlation matrix to disk. So when we leave pretest, we're gonna have the, the strain gauge positions, locations, and we're going to store the correlation matrix to disk. We go to the lab, we place the strain gauges on the physical part, and then we go off and collect the strain data. So the strain data could be collected in the lab, it could be collected in the field, it could be collected in your customer's hands. But we're going to collect time histories of strain data, and then we bring that into post-test, and post-test now is going to take the measured strain data, multiply it by the correlation matrix to a pretest, and that will generate loading functions for us. And now that we've got loads, well, loads are loads are loads. We can bring those back into your FEA models and do that all manually if we want. But what I highly recommend is that we use our true QSC tool, which organizes all the unit load cases and corresponding loading functions automatically, and lets us very quickly and easily probe the FEA model for any type of data response we want. We can generate operating deflection shapes, and we can even then go off and push the data out to our FEA-based fatigue packages is now we'll have strain correlated loading functions that actually mean something, and now you've got a well-defined event that you can feed into your uh, fatigue analysis package, which needs an event, the material data, and your FDA models in order to do the durability calculations. So this is this is um this is what the the uh, the overall flowchart looks like. When we look at it, it looks kind of complex, but if we break it down a little bit, the top four blocks are you turning your part into a load transducer? And the bottom flowchart, are you doing design and optimization once you have um, gotten the loads? So you might do go through the top flowchart, top four blocks once, and go through the bottom flowchart 20, 30 times while you're doing design and optimization on your product. Okay, so I've got this player piano analogy that helps kind of wrap our head around what this looks like. So this is just a totally different way of looking at the problem. And if this helps you, great. If it doesn't, just uh, just bear with me for a minute. So if we were gonna design a player piano, we'd look at the 88 keys of a keyboard, and we'd press each key one by one and listen to the sound it makes. And, for, and we'll create a mapping between the sound and the key press. And I'm gonna call that a musical degree of freedom. And I'm gonna put that into a matrix. A normal person would just call those modes, but I'm calling those musical degrees of freedom and I'm making a matrix of them. Then we go to a concert and listen to a concert. So we record the time history of pressure waves of the concert in our very precise recording device, our ear, and then at night then we go home and we project this time history 
of pressure waves onto our matrix of musical degrees of freedom, or what a normal person would call transcribing that into sheet music. And then once we've got the sheet music, then we can make a player piano roll to reproduce the, the music we heard. So this is how a player piano works. And frankly, True Load works the same way. With True Load, we're gonna take your component part, we're gonna put a series of unit loads on your component part. That's gonna create strain responses. The pretest software looks at those strain responses and figures out the ideal strain gauge placement on the part. And then we go place the strain gauges on the physical part, measure the time histories of strain in the field. And then we take this time histories of strain, we multiply that by the correlation matrix to generate the loads. And then once we've got the loads then we've got this nice time history of loading, which says how each one of these load cases is participating in the full field response. And then we can play that back to reproduce the full field results, okay? So this is, this is what true load's doing, okay? We're reproducing the full field results based on a series of unit load cases. And if you look at this, and if you, if you are all familiar with the concept of modal superposition and uh, modal synthesis, this has got a direct parallel to the concept of using modes and modal participation factors to do modal synthesis, okay? It's not the same mathematics, but it is very parallel to it, okay? So if you're comfortable with doing modal synthesis, you should be comfortable with doing uh, the true load technique. Okay, so this is all based on linear systems and loads, okay? So a linear system is where loads are proportional displacements, displacements are proportional strains, strains are proportional loads. It's a linear system, okay? So I understand everything in life is nonlinear, okay? But we're turning your part into a load transducer. So we need the strain response to be linear. So we're gonna stay away from areas of high strain gradients. We're gonna stay away from welds. We're gonna stay away from bolted joints. We're gonna stay away from pins. We're gonna stay away from areas of contact. We need the strain response to be linear and proportional, okay? The loading can be as nonlinear as anything. So the loading could be sinusoidal loading, it could be ramp loading, it could be impact loading. That's okay. I just need the strain response to be proportional to, this, uh, to the loading. So I can take this diagram here, turn it into a couple of little equations, okay? So the right-hand side, well, that's F equals Kx. So if, you're, if your part is obeying Hooke's law in a, in a gross fashion, you can have local plasticity, that's okay. But if on bulk, your part is obeying Hooke's law, then the left-hand side of the triangle has got to apply, and that's what we're using. We're using strain times correlation matrix is equal to load. This is basically the strain corollary of, of Hooke's law. And we're calculating loads as being strains from test times a correlation matrix from FBA. So this is the basic mathematics of it here, okay? Um, and we don't have enough time to go through the deep, detailed mathematics, which I'm happy to go through with you at any point in time. But we don't have the time to go through the deep, detailed mathematics here today. But uh, I'm sure happy to work with you afterwards and we can, we, can, uh, we can go through the detailed mathematics as well, okay? So this is what we're doing. We're basically calculating the forces as being strains from test times a correlation matrix from FBA, okay? All right, so let's go through that workflow one more time, but this time with a little bit more graphics. This is, a, this is an example that I use in my training classes on my software. So this is a headlamp from a motorcycle. And, and this analyst is looking at this headlamp and saying, well, it's attached to the handlebars of a motorcycle. It's getting excitation from the front wheels, from the suspension, from the handlebars, from the frame, from the engine vibrations. But this is basically a base excitation problem. So he's choosing to model this as restraining the bolt holes to ground and putting 10 G's X, 10 G's Y, and 10 G's Z acceleration. So he's got G load acceleration, and he's, he's saying he can approximate a base excitation with a series of acceleration loads being superimposed. So that, that's his, his thinking about the problem and how he's thinking about loads coming into his structure. He solves the FEA model, fires up true load, and pretest loads up his three load cases automatically, and now he's got to pick a subset of the model for placing gauges, okay? So he's picking elements in the middle of the headlamp bucket and in the middle of the legs here. And he's staying away from boundary conditions and his RBEs, because he wants to be in low strain gradient areas. So he's staying away from these areas of high strain gradient. So he's just getting elements in the middle of the legs and in the middle of the bucket 
where he knows he's going to have low string gradients. And then he goes in and tells Truload he wants six strain gauges. Truload goes out and draws up the strain gauges for him. So these lines are showing the position and orientation of each uniaxial strain gauge on the structure. And, and once he's happy with that, then he goes out and collects the strain data from a physical test. And the whole point now is to take this time history of measured strain data and turn those into loading functions. And he's going to do that in post-test. And so what post-test does, it brings in the correlation matrix from pre-test. It brings in the strain data from test. And then you just push this little button right here to generate the strain data. It's kind of that simple, OK? So there's, there's things here to map and drop channels, to plot data, all sorts of things we can do. But really, at the end of the day, you're bringing in the correlation matrix from pre-test. You're bringing the strain data from test, and you're pushing the button. And when you push that button, what's going to happen it's going to take the strain data times a correlation matrix to generate the loads. And then post-test is going to generate an HTML report for us, showing all the loading it just calculated. And now that we've got the loads, it also goes into the FTA model and pulls out the strains at the strain gauge locations from the FTA model and creates a bunch of correlation plots of measured strain versus simulated strain so you can see how well the simulated strain in the FTA model is matching to the physical strain we measured. So we're going to have these plots, we're going to take a look at them, and if these look good, then we're going to have confidence that we've got the loads right. And then it'll also generate for us one of these true QSE files, which has got the unit loads in it and the corresponding load functions that we were just calculated in post-test. And then we can probe any node or element for any XY plot we want of any data component. We can generate operating deflection shapes, or we can go off and do fatigue analysis. So these are all the things we can do very easily in, in post-test and true QSE. And the whole point now is, so we don't understand the loading now on the baseline structure, that's great. We understand the loading. But now the whole point is, you wanna go back in and do redesign. So in order to do redesign with true load, I recommend doing it this way, is you go back to the part, and now you can poke holes in the parts, you can thicken things up, you can change connections, you can do whatever design improvements you want, remesh the part, do whatever you want to that part, and the only requirement I'm going to put on you is you solve it with the same three unit load cases you start with. So now the FPA solve is very simple, just these, these three unit load cases. And then, then we go back in to true QSC now, and we just have true QSC point to your new set of FPA results, and then it'll, it'll superimpose everything correctly, these, these loading functions. Okay? So this is how true loads giving you a very efficient way to work through very complex loading and very complex redesigns. And those of you who are doing FEA-based fatigue, well, your FEA-based fatigue packages are operating identically the same way, but they're doing it in batch mode, and true QSD is an interactive tool that lets you understand what's going on in your part to interact. Okay? So now we're, um, I've got a series of customer examples here, so we're gonna spend the next 15 minutes here to go through the customer examples. This first one here is a bulldozer. Okay, so this, this customer, um, when they had launched this bulldozer by the time I came and talked to them, but the issue they had is the analysis group couldn't match anything in the, in the lab, and the lab couldn't match anything in the field, and everybody thought the other guy didn't know how to do their job. And I kind of came in there and kind of worked with them, and, and what happened is that we came in and we put XYZ loads in the front of the blade here, there's a hydraulic cylinder we had to actuate, so we put a load along, along the hydraulic cylinder, and there's a mechanism on the back of the blade we had to actuate. So we had five unit loads. We laid 12 strain gauges, so we had gauges on the arms and on the back of the blade here. And what you see on the top right are, are the strain plots. So the green curves, these are the, our 12 measured strain, cur strain data on, on the part. So these, these are what we measured in the field. And then we use those measured strains then to back calculate the loads. Once we had the loads then, we went in and we got the simulated strains from the FDA model, and we plotted those up in blue. So you can see how well the simulated blue curves are matching to the measured green curves. So this looks great. They were happy with this. They thought this was terrific. But, but these were all nominal locations. And their real concerns in development were these forgings that they have on the structure here. So it's really these forgings and the weld list forgings here. So they laid in a bunch of auxiliary gauges as well. So like this gauge number 19 is an auxiliary gauge that they laid. 
And so I've got gauge number 19 plotted up in green here. And then in true QSC, we probed in the FDA model coming away from there and plotted up those strains in, in colors. And you can see how well the simulated strains are matching the measured strains in this hotspot high strain gradient area. Okay. And this is a nice example that just shows that once you get the overall flexibility of the structure right, the hot spots come along for the right. So that's, that's a really nice technique here. If you get the overall loading right of the structure, then you know these areas you're concerned with are really probably going to be simulated properly as well, too. Okay, here's another example of a crankshaft. This customer, after we came and talked to him about the true load technique, they called us up a few weeks later and they said, hey, Tim, We've had this situation on this, on this crankshaft here that we've been breaking the crankshaft on our dynamometers. And so that the, the flywheel end of the crankshaft has been breaking off on the dynamometers. And they've been working on trying to solve this problem for about two years and they haven't had any success. And they were wondering if we, we could help them out. So uh, working with the engineers there, they said, you know what, we've got crank pin loads here. So we put on X and Y loads in the crank pin. And then, and then we also had they also knew that there was dynamic content here as well too. So we included a torsional mode and two bending modes of the flywheel in this FEA model. So we had five unit load cases. We laid strain gauges on the main load paths in here on the crankshaft. And what you're seeing on the top right are my green and blue plots again. So the bottom is what I call the bob and the top is what I call the wow. So the best of the best, the worst of the worst. So the, the bottom curve here we got the green measured strains and the blue simulated strains. They are practically line on line. There might be 0.01% error. But even my worst strain gauge on this on this uh, crankshaft here, uh, my green curves and my blue curves, they're, they're pretty close nonetheless. It, they're probably about 1% error, okay? So I was really confident we were getting, we, we were having good loads. When I reviewed the crank pin loads with the engineers at this company, they said for the speed the engine was running on the dynamometer, the crank pin loads I calculated seemed about right. So they felt comfortable with the loads I calculated. And so we ran all that stuff through the fatigue software, and the fatigue software came back and said that this was the location of maximum damage, and that correlated exactly with where the, the crack was initiating on the real part. So that was a really nice thing. Now I did this in six days. They were working on this problem for two years, okay? It's not that these guys as a company are dumb. They're, they're really smart guys, okay? They, they understand the basic physics. They understood the crank pin loading. They understood the dynamics. They had all of the ingredients. They had all the individual ingredients for the structural loading on this thing. But they didn't have the recipe. And what Chulo did, Chulo provided them the recipe on how to mix all that loading together to reproduce the failures the right way. Chulo is basically uh, coming up with a recipe for the loading. And that's the, that's the magic that True Load's doing. It's actually giving us rest speed to get the loading right. So, uh, so far, all of our loading applications now have just been kind of stationary loads. The loads haven't moved on the structure. But, but I've got a client here who makes these types of cranes, and these, these boom cranes here where you've got uh, one boom sliding inside of the other. And so now you've got the loads moving on the structure as the, as the boom is extending. And so we had to come up with a with a technique to give them the ability to calculate the loads. And so what we came up with is, with is what we call sliding loads. Um, so, so you can set up stationary loads in the structure where you know these loads are never gonna move. And then where you've got moving loads, you can basically set up a series of unit load cases at a location, drop off a correlation matrix at this location, and then we move to the next location and drop off, we set up another series of unit loads and drop off another correlation matrix. So we set up a series of correlation matrices that we store the correlation matrices along with the position where those correlation matrices are. And now when we lay strain gauges, we can be super efficient because now our strain gauges just need to be sensitive to the stationary loads plus one set of moving loads at a time. So then we can be efficient with our strain gauge placement. And now then when we collect the strain data, we just need to collect the strain data plus the position of the boom as it moves through the structure. And that position is going to allow us to turn a correlation matrices on and off and linearly super, super uh, and linearly interpolate between them. Okay. So, so that, that technique then gave us really nice results. And I actually got real live results here. So this is actually 
real test data. And what you see on the bottom left are my green and blue plots there, and it looks like a mess. It's hard to tell what's going on. So I created a cross plot. And so that cross plot next to it, we've got measured strain on the horizontal axis, simulated strain on the vertical axis. We've got a near 45 degree angle. So that's, that's really amazing because we, we had 50 some strain gauges, 90 some load cases, and we were able to get that type of correlation. So that, that's amazing, okay? And then we can take those lo that loading time history then and play that back in and create the operating deflection shape. And you look at the animation on the screen there, that's highly nonlinear, okay? That's a highly nonlinear animation going on there. But everything coming into this structure, into this analysis, was linear. Every load case we put on this thing was linear. But somehow we get this highly nonlinear set of results. And what TrueLoad is doing is TrueLoad is basically letting the strain gauges be the world's largest supercomputer to basically back calculate and tell us how to mix together each of these load cases to get the proper full field strain response from the structure. So TrueLoad is actually is leveraging the strain gauges and let them, letting them tell us what, what's happening on the structure. Okay? And when you think about that, well, that's not too terribly different than a nonlinear FPA solver. So if you think of a nonlinear solver like Abacus, you know, it does a, it does a very nonlinear solve, but every step of the solution sequence in that nonlinear solve, it's a linear, they're doing a small linear analysis, okay? And they're doing a series of linear analyses to get to their nonlinear solution. Well, Truland's doing the same thing. We're just doing it in a different order, okay? So we're basically doing the same type of technique as what a nonlinear analysis would be doing, okay? All right. So now, we, now the two fun projects here, okay? So the Baja car suspension. So this was a great project to work on. Uh, these, these students at the university were a lot of fun. One of them was my employee. And, and so um, what they wanted to do is they wanted to understand the loads on their suspension arm on the Baja car here. So they came in and they set up a, um, XYZ loads in the shock. They had XYZ loads in the wheel location. We had a top and bottom uh, loads on, the, on their stabilizer links. So they kind of came up with 11 unit load cases here on the FDA model, and then um, and then they solved it. And here's all the 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 basically the unit load case response from the FDA model. Okay, so these are all the unit load cases they had in the FDA model. And then they went to the true load software. The true load software said place strain gauges at these locations here, and you can see that there's a number of locations on the tubes here on the on the arm, but there's a lot of strain gauges on this forging. And this makes sense because most of the load cases are here. So we're, we need to differentiate the load paths by having strain gauges on the forging. We're basically laying strain gauges on the primary load paths. And then once we did that, um, the students then went and placed strain gauges on the forging, on the, on the arm structure. They, just, they set up the, the data collection system and did the programming. Now, I have to emphasize, these are students, okay? So the one student who was working for me, he was a graduate student, and the other two students, they were undergrad. These guys had never touched a strain gauge. They had only made FEA models in their, in their classes in college, so they never made a real FEA model. They had never touched a data collection system. They had never programmed one. So they, they went from knowing absolutely nothing to completing this project in six weeks. Now, I gave them coaching, and I gave them lots of help here, but they did all the work and they were able to do that. They even went out and built jumps and they put them in the, in the parking structure of the, of the university. And so we're collecting data going over this, this jump here and they did some hard breaks and some hard turns and so they kind of made up their own, own uh, duty cycle for their, for their Baja car here. So we're collecting data here and then we were able to get nice results out of that. So these are kind of the plots we've been looking at. So let me go through this a little bit more detail here. So the green curves here, these are the 16 strain gauges that the students laid on their structure here. So this is the green curves or the measured data. We took that measured data then, we multiplied it by the correlation matrix, and that output the time histories of the 11 loading functions that they were wanting to get on their structure. And then once they had that, the, that time history of loading then, the post-test software went back into the FDA model and pulled out uh, simulated strains at the strain gauge locations off the FDA model and plotted that up in blue. And then, and then the post test software then also created this cross plot of measured strain versus simulated strain 
and you got this nice 45 degree line here, okay? So they did a great job with, with being able to do that. And what's interesting about this is that these students, they, they don't know that nobody else does this. They just think everybody does it this way. So, so it was a very interesting exercise is that they were a little bit, you know, uh, humble about what happened there. It's like, guys, no, nobody does this. So, um, and then what their whole thing is that they wanted to go and do redesign. So basically, they, they took their duty cycle, they made up a duty cycle of, you know, 30 hard breaks, 40 hard turns, 20 jumps, and then that, that, they said that, that was one, one duty cycle event, which was about 5.6 hours. And so when they ran it through the fatigue software, the fatigue software said that they had 278,000 repeats of that five hours there. So that was more life than they needed to have in this thing. So they came in and they started thinning, thinning up tubes. They could basically thin up all the tubes except for this main diagonal tube here. And they were able to get 25% weight savings. The life dropped from 278,000 repeats down to 12,000 repeats. Still plenty of durability for them. And so they got 25% weight savings on their Baja car design. And they published a paper in the uh, SAE World Con uh, uh, Congress last year. Um, so this is a really, this is a fun project and they got really great results out of it. So last, last customer example here. So this is the, uh, the lawn and garden tractor. So this is uh, Aaron's, they're a customer of ours. They, they make these high end lawn and garden tractors, um, zero turning radius mowers. So they're, they're high end tractors. They're also used for commercial purposes. And so this is the engine deck that sits under the seat. The engine and transmission sit on this. And their baseline system, this was working just fine for them, but their transmission supplier was asking them to provide airflow through this so they could cool the transmission better. So they had to come up with some way of getting airflow through this. And so they came to us to see if we could help them out. And, and so working with them, we decided that this was basically going to be a base excitation problem because this thing basically just going over bumps on their duty cycle and the proving grounds. So basically we put on X, Y, and Z acceleration loading on the structure to be the G loading of the structure. We had a lump mass representing the engine and transmission. And, and then the true load software pl said place strain gauges on these eight locations here. So we had eight strain gauges laid on the structure. And then once, once, uh, once we had the strain gauges laid, then we kind of just did our thing. Okay. So we go to the proving grounds then and, and we, so what the green curves here, these are the eight strain gauges going across your proving grounds. And then what you see on this curve as well, on this plot too, are the blue stimulated strains coming from the loads that we back calculated. And they're line on line, and you can actually see the cross plot here, a measured strain versus simulated strain. And this is a near perfect set of, set of results we're getting back from that. So this is fantastic. And then I could take those loads and create an operating deflection shape of the system. And, and so this is perfect. And now these guys had, had, were so proud that they had started this redesign effort on their own. They had design guidelines for redesigning these, heat pan, these, uh, these engine pans. And so they had used their design guide methodology for coming up with the loads for this, this in, engine pan themselves. And they made the first design iteration on their own. And they were so proud of this. They wanted to show it to me on the shaker test in the lab. And we went down to the lab to take a look at the at this thing on shaker test, and it had broke an hour before we got there. And on the shaker test, they had accumulated 12 hours on their shaker test, and it's supposed to go 10,000 hours. And I said, "Perfect, give me that FEA model and let me run it through." And now you can see the, the whole pattern that they had. You can see that we're getting higher stress and strain response. The next slide I'm going to show you is durability, and then working with the engineers there, we came up with a new design. So. We basically came up with a different whole pattern, and we started off with two layers of sheet metal riveted together, and the, the manufacturing guys absolutely hated that, and they said, we, we can't do that. So we had, to, we had to get back down to one set of sheet metal, so we had thicker sets of sheet metal, and we iterated back and forth to, to find a design that worked for us, and by the end of the week, this is the design we had. And just to show you what the durability looks like here is, uh, on the top left, this is their fatigue, this is their fatigue material. So basically yellow is 10,000 hours, which is what they want. So what we wanna look for is yellow, green, and blue on these plots. So their baseline was just fine. 
Uh, there's a little bit of red here because of the RBE and the FDA model, but really their baseline was just fine, okay? And then here's the model that, that broke in their shaker test, okay? The, on the shaker test, this went 12 hours in the shaker test. The FDA, the fatigue software is saying 10 hours. So this was yet another confirmation that we got the loading right. And then using that, having that confidence, we were able to go in and go through the redesign. And by the end of the week, we had a, a design that, ex, that actually got the airflow they needed and had durability actually better than they started off with, okay? So this is just what you can do if you um, get the loads right and can understand what's going on. And that leads us back to our money slide, okay? So, so again, you know, they were estimating this would have been $150,000, you know, for five design iterations in 30 weeks. And we did this in eight days and under $1,000 of amortized costs. So that's what you can do with two loads, okay? So uh, I've got one, one final topic I want to talk upon, and this will just be a few minutes here. This is a very hot topic these days about embedded technology. You know, the, the buzzword is IoT, Internet of Things. So you can take this true load technology and you can actually embed it in your consumer's products. We're actually in the, in the, in the process of talking to a wind turbine company in India right now. And we're actually talking to another sports sporting goods manufacturer about incorporating this into some shoes. So there's, there is a lot of excitement about being able to bring this technology into the consumer space. And the way that can look is like this, is that we can start with a pretest software and get the correlation matrix out of the pretest software. We can bring that correlation matrix to a chip. You can store, store all the strain gauges on your consumer product and set up the, the, the sampling off the strain gauges during real-time use. So that could be a thousand samples per second, it could be 10 samples per second, it could be you know, one sample every five seconds. But you can, you can figure out how you want to sample that data and bring that on to your onboard computer. And then the math is very simple. It's just the measured strain times a correlation matrix is going to give us time histories of loads. And now that we've got those loads, we can generate correlation plots and confidence plots in real time. And if you had hot spots that you were concerned about, we could actually extract an auxiliary matrix, and that auxiliary matrix could generate these hot spot strains, and we could feed those into your um, into your fatigue software to generate plots on estimated hours of life left on the part. So this is all stuff that could happen in real time on your consumer's product, and you know the way it can look at for the consumer is that you set all this stuff up. And they can have some nice force monitoring displays. We can show them system degradation to see if any stiffness is changing on their part. And then we can show them plots for you know, life, rema life remaining on their structure. And from a design engineering standpoint, you've got the ability to get actual time hit series from your customers and then use that for design for durability. So it's a pretty powerful way to kind of take a look and understand what's going on. Okay? So this is, a, this is an extension of what we're using. The correlation matrices we generate we give those to you for free. So that's your intellectual property. We're more than happy to help you with this and implement this, but, but at the end of the day, you own the correlation matrix and that's your intellectual property, okay? All right, and just to, to summarize, you know, TrueLoad's gonna give us the ability to have optimal strain gauge placement. You're gonna get excellent strain correlation and you're gonna get these strain correlated load histories. And one of the, one of the, one of the beauties is that you get to reduce your test costs because now all you're doing is buying uni axle strain gauges that cost about 10 bucks a piece rather than load transducers which cost you know tens of thousands of dollars and you get to measure every loading degree of freedom you're interested in so that's it that's just amazing stuff but even better is that now that you're getting strain correlated load histories your engineers are now going to have the knowledge to get uh, to, to, to do the design iterations on their on their structures, and then you end up you end up eliminating whole iteration cycles because the engineers are making de better design decisions by the parts because they fully understand the loading. Okay, so we've got really nice things. I'd love to spend more time on sliding loads, hybrid loads, contact controlled embedded solutions. We've got some really nice extended applications. We'd love to have an opportunity to talk to you all about that. But this is really the overall summary of what, what TrueLoad can do for you. And, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, 
This is our contact information. Please uh, get in touch with Vias. Vias is, is, is our uh, important value-added reseller, so please work with them. And we're more than happy to work with you and through Vias. So please uh, contact Vias with uh, any questions you've got, and they will get in touch with us. We've got a great partnership with them. So uh, thank you very much. And got q and I see we've got a lot of questions rolling in here on the Q&A. So let me just take a quick look at them and, uh, and see what we've got here. So first question is, um, how, how big and complex of a structure can we, can we get the loadings on? Um, uh, and, and also, if no, if none, I don't quite understand. Also, if no, of forces are more in number and how accurate will they be? So, so I think this is basically general is how scalable is a solution and how, um, how much can we do? Um, so the the um, the scalability is there. There is no inherent limit to the number of gauges, or the or the size of the model, or the number of load cases. Okay. So I'm you know I've recently just completed a project with one of my customers. It was a you know five or five or six million element FBA model, and it was a huge structure about the size of a of a uh, of a semi trailer, and we had, you know, dozens of, of load cases. Okay, so then we got great results out of that. So, so basically, you got to look at your structure, figure out what you want to do, and then you just got to check. So, you, there's some methodology to it, but we, but the, 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 the technique is basically scalable. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Okay, so there's a question about the example I showed on the on the bulldozer. It says when you model the load in the blade, was it distributed or or a point load in the blade? So so the that that bulldozer example that was a specific test that they, that this customer calls a pile dig or something like that. So the load was concentrated on the center front of the blade, and so so in that instance we could put a concentrated load right on the center front, but um, the ability is there to put distributed loading and to do some very complex distribution of loading, okay? So if, we, if they wanted to have a more distributed loading profile, we could have done that. But for this specific example, we just wanted to do a center-based load, okay? Uh, let's see, I have another question. Uh, uh, I found some interesting commonality between this methodology with the time domain wave-induced fatigue analysis in marine engineering solutions. Are you aware of these applications? I have not done any projects with uh, with uh, marine engineering solutions. I am currently working on some projects with the Army, but I haven't done any marine-based ones yet. So um, I'm sure there are, these technologies are very similar. Um, this is a problem that people have been thinking about for a very long time, and I know some individual companies have got some homegrown solutions for this. Um, we've got a very mature product here, and we can basically handle just about any problem you throw at us. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, we've got another question about, is this, is this method valid for transient response analysis and also static response analysis using inertia relief? So, um, the, uh, so yes, this, this technique is, is very much transient, okay? Um, everything we do is in the time domain. Um, and many of our customers uh, use inertia relief. In fact, several of the problems I showed you were using inertia relief. That the Baja car suspension arm was using inertia relief, and uh, and the uh, my my customer that makes the the large industrial equipment they also use inertia relief all the time. We it's a very common technique for us here. Um, so yes, yes to both those questions. Um, have you applied this method on, on agricultural field? So uh, one of my customers is John Deere. So I, I would just have to say, yes, we've done it for agriculture. We're, uh, we've got a big presence in the John Deere Harvester Division, okay? All right, guys, I think we are out of time. Um, this, this, uh, this meeting has been recorded 
And uh, Bias will get you a copy of the recording so you can download it and play it back at your leisure. So thank you very much, Bias. And I think we're done. And please contact Bias if you've got any more questions um, or would like some follow-up. I'm more than happy to, to meet with each of you individually. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Bye.